Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we will get started. Uh, my name is Mustafa Mohamed. I am uh, um, a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. <clears throat> and uh, today we'll talk about structural steel uh, connections. Um, in uh, connection design is uh, the most important thing in any structural steel uh, and in any uh, uh, structural steel building design in general. Uh, typically designing the members uh, is um, simple uh, compared to the connections because in designing members, typically we need to check few limit states to make sure the member works, whether it's for tension, compression, uh, bending, shear, torsion, etc. Uh, but we have many limit states that need to be checked for connections depending on the conditions that we have, as we will see uh, today. So in, in this simple uh, chart, uh, we see uh, the, the limit states that need to be checked for um, each connecting element, such as the angle, the plate, bolts, welds, and also um, uh, other checks that need to be done in the beams and the columns. And also if we are connecting to the concrete. So uh, this is a very comprehensive uh, chart that tells you what needs to be checked. Now, not all of these limit states are checked in every connection, but depending on the loads that we have in the connection, um, either all or some of these limit states need to be checked as applicable. Just to give you the simplest, uh, um, the, uh, the simplest thing is if we are checking, for example, um, bolts, then uh, it depends if the bolts are subjected to shear or tension. Uh, then we need to check that. Sometimes they are checked <clears throat> to a combination of tension and shear. Then we have to check for the combination of both of them using the AISC provisions. So uh, this is a good reference for your connection design, always that you can go back to and see what, what need to be checked. So the references for this uh, uh, presentations the presentation is the AISC 360 uh, specifications, chapter J in particular, um, in, uh, and also in the AISC manual uh, for the bolts, it's part seven, for the welds is part eight, and also design of connections, which is parts, parts nine through 13 of the manual. So there's the, the, the <clears throat> part 16, which is the specifications. And then there is the manual that has uh, design aids. The commonly used connections typically are uh, shear connections or as known also simple connections. The common ones are double angle connections, single plate or as known shear tap connection, shear end plate connection and stiffened seated connection, single plate connection and T shear connection. There are others, but these are the most commonly used ones. Now, um, the commonly used bolts are uh, starting with A307, uh, which is uh, which are known as machine bolts. Now, these are not used in um, in uh, connecting main structural elements together. For that. We use either group A or group B. These are the commonly used one, but there's also in the 15th edition, there's also group C that can be used, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, which has higher strength than group A and B. Now, A307 bolts can be used in, con in connecting like non-structural components, architectural components, mechanical components, etc., cetera, uh, facade uh, components, for those, we can use A307. Now, in the 15th edition of the manual, we have, um, and for group bolts A and B, we have um, uh, ASTM specifications for the type of bolts that can be used as shown here. So any of these uh, would, would uh, you know, can be specified. Uh, like in the drawings, typically we specify 
uh, the uh, what ASTM uh, standard we are using for the bolt. So any of these should be okay. What's common typically in connecting beams, columns, uh, et cetera, is the A325 for group A and A490 for uh, group B. Um, now the bolt types uh, depend on uh, the way we install them and also where the threads are within the, the, within the load transfer. So we have type N and X and SC that slip critical. Um, so type N is basically when the threads are included in the shear plane. Uh, that's where the load is transferred between two plates and X is where the threads are excluded from the shear plane. So if the threads are included, then we have smaller area um, to resist the load. So typically the capacity for those is less. Uh, if they are excluded, then we have larger area, then there is higher strength also. Um, the slip critical connection has its uses, uh, of course, in uh, certain applications. Uh, and uh, the, the load transfer typically is done by friction between the connected elements, okay? So typically we use, or we tend to use the bearing type connection, that the bearing type connections in general that, that use type N or type X bolts. And in certain applications where uh, where we would like uh, a, um, to avoid uh, slip and uh, the load will be transferred through friction. So we specify those uh, if, if necessary, but always try to specify bearing type connections, even for seismic applications. Um, okay, the limit states that are related to bolt uh, to bolts, uh, first is bolt shear. Uh, now, in general, in general, whenever we have bolted connection, typically we have a lot of limit states to check. Keep that in mind. If we have welded connection, we have much less limit states to check. Now, we also, uh, you know, have to uh, worry about uh, the practicality of this. So, if we have bolted connections, that's the preferred type. Uh, from uh, like installation standpoint and also from an economical standpoint in the field. Uh, if we have welded connection, that probably would be easier for the engineer who's designing that because the engineer doesn't have to check many limit states, but that is expensive and it has its challenging, uh, its challenges in, in the field. So if we are uh, for bolts, uh, the first limit state is bolt shear which is specified in equation J3-1, which is basically uh, Fn, and that's the nominal shear stress multiplied by the area of the ball shank. And then whether we are using LRFD or ASD, we use phi for LRFD and omega for ASD to determine the design strength. So phi Rn or Rn divided by omega. <clears throat> now for we have to be careful here. If we are using LRFD, then we have to use the factored load combinations. If we are using ASD, then we have to use the ASD load combinations, okay, which are typically the unfactored load combinations. So table J3.2 in the specifications uh, gives the, the nominal strength of fasteners and threaded part. So for the for A307 group uh, group A uh, and the group B, and whether it's N type or X type, whether the threads are included or excluded, <clears throat> uh, or as indicated here, not excluded. That means included. So here, if it's uh, if if the bolts are in tension, then we use the nominal tensile strength FNT. If the bolts are in shear, then we use the nominal shear strength FNV. So the FN in the equation, we get it from uh, this table. 
uh, and then, so that's in the specifications in chapter J, but in the manual, uh, the manual gives us a lot of design aids that we can use. So we have table seven one, which has the available shear strength uh, of the bolts of different diameters, uh, as you can see, five eight three quarters, seven eight one, etc. And then we have the nominal bolt area also given to us. And here with a group A, uh, B or C, as I indicated, the new manual has also a grade C and whether it's N type or X type. And um, so we have that, for example, if in the, 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 the nominal strength in ASD FNV over omega and the nominal strength phi FNV in LRFD given here. And also we have the loading, the loading condition, which is S, of D, S is for single shear plane. That means if we have two plates connected together or an angle and a plate, so we have only one shear plane. So that's single. Or if we have D, that's double shear plane. So if we have two shear planes transferring the load, best example about that, if you have double angle connection. So you have, you have, for, you have for example, the beam web, and then from each side of the beam web, you have an angle. So you have two angles and the web in between. So we have two shear planes to transfer the load. And you can look at that, you'll see it's double. Typically the, the capacity is double if you look at the numbers. So here we have the capacities in LRFD and in ASD. And table 7.3 gives the slip critical connections. Uh, capacities, uh, and this is uh, given for different uh, uh, class fitting surface. So there's, uh, uh, and which depends on the coefficient of friction. Also, as I said, the force is transferred by friction. So, uh, and also depends on the preparation of the surface. Uh, to, uh, to transfer the load. So that's why cl class A fang surface, and there are, you know, uh, different uh, uh, classes for that. So this is for group A bolts. We have the capacity. Again, this depends on the whole type, whether it's a STD that's standard, or if we have short slotted uh, hole. Uh, so whether it's also single or double shear. And also we have, if it's oversized uh, hole or if it's long slotted hole as well. So uh, we have different conditions uh, given here and the capacities are given in ASD and LRFD. We have bolt bearing uh, also limit state. So when we have bolt bear, when we have uh, bolts, we have to check the bolt bearing on the material. So here, as you can see in the, in, 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 in the photo, uh, so we can see deformation around the hole. This deformation is created as a result of the bolt pushing on the hole material, on the steel material. Uh, so we have to make sure that the steel material can take that load that's coming from the bolt. So that's bolt bearing. And we have two cases here that we need to check. One is called the tear out and the other is called bolt bearing. So the tear out is basically was when one type of the material is separated from, 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 the, the, from the steel plate. Uh, if it's bearing, then it causes just deformation around the bolt hole. So we have to uh, take that, uh, we have to check both and use the one that controls. So for the bolt bearing, this is the different equation here, 2.4 times D times T times F sub U. So it depends on the bolt diameter, the thickness of the material, and also the ultimate strength of the material, okay? And this one depends on uh, the tear out and the ultimate strength of the material, L sub C. L sub C is typically the clear distance between the bolt holes, the clear distance, not the center to center, or, or the, the, the clear distance from the edge of the bolt to the outside edge. Okay, so that's L sub C. So, uh, so the failure could be in that, in that uh, uh, fashion. Uh, so table seven four in the manual gives us 
also available bearing and tear out strength. Uh, so um, again, this is here, if you look at the capacities, this is in kip per inch. So because this depends on the steel material, so it depends on the thickness of that steel material. So that's why the capacities are given in kip per inch. So whatever value you take from this table, okay, you, um, you multiply it by the thickness of the material, then you get the capacity. Of course, depending on the, on the size of the, of the bolt diameter. Also here, this depends on the bolt spacing, yes. So whether it's uh, two and two thirds times the bolt diameter or if it's three inches, because that, that this is the spacing between the bolts is important. And also it affects whether you have tear out or whether you have bolt bearing. And also, the st so since this depends on F sub U, which is the ultimate strength of the material, so we have two ultimate strengths here. So 58 KSI, which is typically for A36 steel, and 65 KSI, which is for example, for A992 steel for like the beam sizes, for the, uh, for the beam material and the color material that is, uh, that is commonly used. And then we have uh, the, the available bolt bearing based on the edge distance. So the previous one is based on the bolt spacing. And this one depends on the edge distance, okay? So if we go back to the figure here, so we have to check the bolt bearing based on, on the spacing, which is between the bolts, and also on the edge distance and add them together. So in this case, we have two bolts, right? in one row. So we check bolt bearing based on the spacing. And then we also check bolt bearing based on the edge distance and we add them together. So that's for one row. We have two rows, then we multiply that by two. Okay, that's how typically uh, we do it. Okay. Now for also bolt bearing, um, it depends also whether the deformation is uh, is a design consideration or not. So if if uh, deformation will affect the uh, behavior of the connection or the attached elements to it or not. So uh, we talked about the 2.4 DTs F sub U. This is when uh, 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 when, the, when the deformation at the bolt hole is a design consideration. If it's not a design consideration, then we use the, we, we, we have higher capacity, 3.0 uh, times DT F sub U. And the same thing for tear out, instead of the 1.2, we use 1.5. Uh, bolt tension, so the bolts are in tension. So the failure could be something like this. And then we have the same equation, J3-1, like we talked before for, uh, for bolt shear, but the difference here is Fn. Just like we said before, Fn could be Fnt for tension or Fnv for uh, shear, okay? So uh, we also have in uh, part seven, uh, the available tensile strength of the bolts in, in table 7-2. And here, similar to shear, but this is just tension and the size, the bolt size. So we get the capacities in tension for the bolt based on its di diameter and based on, of course, its strength, which is group A, B, or C, or A3, A3 or 7. Um, block shear. So block shear is another limit state. Uh, that we need to check. So in the picture, you can see here how block shear may happen. So here, if we have a tension force, so basically a block of steel will be separated from, from, uh, from the gusset plate and will be moved out. So we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. So this depends on the, on, 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 on the shear area that's parallel to the load, which is which is at both edges, top and bottom, and also on the tension area, which is perpendicular to the load, okay? So using J4-5 equation, um, 
and whether we are using the net uh, and also the net area and uh, the net area, uh, the net shear area, the net tension area, and the gross shear area, um, uh, we can determine that. U is a factor here that's used for uniform tension stress distribution. Um, so it's one for that case, and it's 0 0.5 for non-uniform tension stress. Uh, typically, most of the connections that we de deal with, we use U equal one because they have uniform stress distribution, but there are some cases where we have to use uh, 0 0.5, especially if you have uh, shear connections with two rows, oh, sorry, two columns of boards not two rows, two columns of boards. So we will, in that case, we will not have a uniform stress distribution. So we also have tables in part nine of the manual for block shear. So this is block shear tension rupture component. So you see here, it's the component phi sub fu times a and t. So this depends on the material itself, the steel itself. So the tables are prepared for any thickness. So that's why what you have here is kip per inch, okay, kip per inch. So, um, so for whatever thickness we are dealing with, we multiply that by the thickness and then we'll get the capacity. Now this depends also in, in L sub EH, that's the horizontal edge distance. So we are given that here for whatever value you have then you can get the capacity for that. And it depends on the board diameter and also depends on, um, depends on the board diameter and also uh, depends um, uh, on the material. So this is for 50 KSI steel, okay? So this, if you are using, if you're checking that for the beam, A992 steel beam, this is not true. So we need to look for the table that has 65 KSI, okay? So, um, um, so this is the block shear, uh, shear yielding component. So you see 0 0.6 FY times AGV, okay? Again, this depends on the thickness and also depends on FY. Since it's shear yielding, then we use FY. So whether it's A36, for example, or if it's A992. Um, and also it depends on, on the number of the number of bolts that you have. So N is the number of bolts along the depth of the web. Okay. And here we have the block shear shear rupture component. So this depends on FU, so whether it's 58 or 65. So A36 or A992, for example, and then it depends also in the bolt diameter, okay? Also in the number of bolts and also in the, in the vertical edge distance LEV, okay? The, min, the minimum spacing and edge distance. Uh, so section J3.3 gives the minimum spacing as two and two, as two and two third times the bolt diameter. Um, uh, the preferred uh, is 3D uh, and uh, E. Uh, the, the edge distance is half of that, so is divided by two. Um, so typically we use three inch and one and a half inch for E, uh, three for S and one and a half for E. And uh, of course, this is assuming that uh, um, the bolt diameter is, is less than one inch or one inch or less. If it's more, then we have to be careful about the minimum required. Um, fillet weld strength. So for the weld limit states, we have uh, J2-3 equation, which is the nominal stress of the weld material multiplied by the effective area of the weld material, okay? So fillet weld is the commonly used one and the, also the recommended, uh, the recommended one. Um, so uh, the nominal 
stress of the weld material is 0 0.6 times FEXX, and FEXX is the strength of the uh, weld electrode, okay? And uh, uh, the effective area is 0 0.707 times the weld size times the length of the weld, okay? So that's how we calculate that. Um, now, if we have uh, uh, the, the general weld uh, equation, uh, the weld strength equation is 0 0.6 times FEXX times what's in parentheses here. So we have a theta angle. A theta angle is the angle between the load and the, um, the weld line. Okay, the load and the weld line. So if the load and the weld line are parallel, then theta is zero. Then we will have 0 0.6 times FEXX. But if they are at an angle, then uh, we will have more strength. So as you can see, one plus. So we'll have more strength and that, that uh, will be an advantage in case we need, we need, uh, we need that. If we have combinations of weld that is longitudinal and transverse uh, to the load, then um, we can consider both and we can um, uh, use uh, the larger of these two. So we can just calculate the weld strength of the, the, of the longitudinal weld and the strength of the transverse weld, add them together like this or 0 0.85 times the, the longitudinal weld strength plus 1.5 times the transverse, calculate both and use the larger one. Connecting elements in tension. So um, tension yielding. So now checking the plate itself, for example, yeah, the connecting element here is referred to like the, the element that connects the two parts together. So here it's the plate. So there's tension yielding, which happens in the gross area, Fy times Ag, okay? So whenever we're talking about the yielding limit state, then we use Fy. Whenever we are talking about rupture limit state, then we use F sub U, okay? Uh, F sub U and the net area, sorry. So talk about the net area. So yielding on the gross area, rupture on the net, area. So, so that's what we have here. Uh, A sub E is basically the effective area, which is equal to the net area times um, the shear lag factor, okay? For the plate, typically the shear lag factor is one. So that will be, uh, this A sub E will be the same as A sub N. Um, but we will talk about if it's, if it's different, okay? And then shear yielding, again, shear yielding. So yielding, again, we use Fy and also the gross shear area, AGV, okay? And whenever we use shear, then we use 0 0.6 times, whether it's Fy or F sub U, F sub U depending on, on the limit state. So here, 0 0.6 F sub U, because it's shear rupture. <clears throat> And then multiplied by A and V, that's the net shear area. Again, rupture, net shear area, shear, 0 0.6 multiplied by, by, by the strength, okay? Uh, so limit states under concentrated forces. So when we have concentrated forces, we may have some limit states that need to be checked. And these are, would be web crippling. Okay, web crippling, so that's, um, uh, basically, as you can see in the in the figure below, if you have concentrated load from the top, then the the uh, crippling may happen in the web as shown here. Okay. Um, so how do we check if this web can take that load or so for something like this not to happen? So we check the equation that's shown uh, above, which depends on basically the depth of the member, the bearing length, that's L sub B, the web thickness, the flange thickness, and then the material properties here, okay? 
so and it depends also with where is that uh, load located uh, if it's at d over two um, if it's more than d over two from the support or if it's less than d over two from the support so if it's like the reaction load or just away from from the supports which could be a concentrated load okay um so here it defines what is l sub b okay how uh, we can consider that and of course the the if the influence area which depends uh, shown in the dashed line so this area will be lb sub times 5k and k of course is the the fillet distance the fillet distance, which is from from the top to uh, uh, to the end of the fillet, or if it's welded to the end of the weld, as shown here at the top left. So here at the, the at the bottom left, so as you can see, a beam is supported by an angle here. So that beam will have a reaction. So there will be a reaction on that web. So that web need to be checked for the web crippling. Um, so for concentrated forces uh, applied at the distance greater than the depth of the member, uh, the, the capacity is equal to, uh, the, as shown in this equation, um, so considering the influence area, and if the concentrated force is at a distance less or equal than the depth of the member, then it's it we use this equation so both are shown here actually so if it's at the end then you see here l sub b plus 2.5 k here l sub b plus 5 k okay and then sometimes we need to determine what is the minimum bearing length okay what is the minimum bearing length so that can be determined from this equation so for the end condition at the uh, at the at the um, at, the, at the beam for the reactions. Okay, websites way buckling. That's another thing that we need to check. So whether the bib, whether the web, sorry, will buckle um, sideways or not. So we can um, use these equations to uh, make sure that uh, that doesn't happen. Now. If we have in many cases, if we have large concentrated forces on the beams with that may cause uh, buckling or crippling, in many cases in practice, we use stiffness. Okay, we use stiffness. So if we use stiffness, then we don't have to check these limit states. Okay, if we use stiffness, we don't have to check these limit states. Um, So this shows like, for example, flange local bending uh, limit state. So you can see the bending in the flanges. Okay, and this is again due to the concentrated forces. These concentrated forces at the top and the bottom are coming from the moment. So this is the moment connection. And then we can resolve the moment and that will give us, uh, that will give us forces, uh, concentrated forces that will give us concentrated forces, um, that will give us concentrated forces at the flanges that may cause that, uh, that, uh, that buckling, uh, you know, could be local buckling or could be also like bending of the flange as well. So here, uh, web local buckling. So here, uh, the buckling is in the web itself, okay? As a result of the concentrated forces in the, in the beams. So this is flexural yielding uh, or web local yielding. So whenever we have, you know, that wash is gone during an experiment, of course, then this means that this area, uh, this area has yielded, okay, has yielded and has reached its yield strength. So that's why we, we have that. So that yielding is in the web. Uh, playing action. So playing action basically is the separation, is the separation between the material as a result of a load that's applied in that direction. So, um, so we have to, of course, make sure 
that this doesn't happen. This is done typically by checking, by you know, having the thickness of this uh, controlling the design to prevent something like that. Okay. Uh, with more section. Uh, yielding buckling gusset plate. So if we have gusset plate, we have members connected to the gusset plate. So if we have compression force, then this gusset plate may buckle. Then we can check that buckling on this, on this um, um, area. So we we using a 30 degree here, so we can get what's LW and use with the thickness of the plate, we can get the area. Of the of the of the element that need to be checked for buckling, okay. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, shear connections. All bolted double angle connections. Uh, so here now we will check. Uh, we will check uh, what uh, limit states need to be checked, and what is covered by the tables. So. For different types of connections, there are tables. So we need to check uh, what is covered by the tables for the different types of connections and what we need to check by hand. So here we have double angle connections. So uh, these are all the limit states that need to be checked. So for bolts, we need to check bolt shear and then we need to block shear, bolt bearing, flexural yielding, local wood buckling, shear rupture, shear yielding. We need to check all these. Now, limit states covered by the tables, bolt shear, bolt bearing of the angles, shear yielding of the angles, shear rupture of the angles, block shear of the angles. So you see, not everything. Um, so um, uh, so that's, that's for the connecting elements. And now for the beam web, bolt bearing, for beam scoped at the top only, block shear rupture is also considered. And then for beams coped at both flanges, shear yielding and shear uh, rupture are also considered. Now, flexural yielding and flexural rupture, especially for the coped section cases, okay? If we have a coped section like this, okay? So here uh, uh, for that, typically we need to check flexural yielding and flexural rupture. These need to be checked independently. The tables do not cover those, okay? And this is table 10-1 that, uh, uh, that gives the double angle connection capacity and depend, it depends on the bolt group type. It depends on whether it's N or X type or uh, uh, slip critical. It depends also on uh, the material. So what angle material, what beam material? It depends also on the number of rows, uh, you know, of boards. So this is like 12 rows, okay? And also depends on the angle thickness, okay? So you can get the capacity in kips for, uh, for whatever uh, uh, connection that you may have. And here below, if this is in the same page in the manual, below we have like beam web available strength that's in kip per inch because it could be any beam that's used, okay? So, and it depends on the, the, the vertical, uh, you know, edge distance, whether it's coped at the top flange only or coped at both flanges or uncoped, okay? You get the capacity and then you multiply that by the, by the web thickness, okay? And compare that to the applied load. Support available strength, Per, um, uh, per inch thickness, again. So uh, this is, uh, uh, if, if the beam is uh, connected to another beam, girder, using this, uh, uh, using, uh, you know, uh, a double angle bolted connection, then we can also check the girder web per, uh, per this. Or if it's connected to a column, column flange or column web, we can get this and then multiply that by uh, uh, by the thickness. Uh, bolted welded double angle connection. So here you can see we have bolts on one side and welds on the other side. Okay, so bolt, this is not bolted, 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 welded. So the limit states that need to be checked 
are these. So again, you have weld from one side, but we have bolts. So we have most of the bolt limit states that need to be checked, okay? So similar to what we did before, basically, because we have the bolts. So uh, what's covered, uh, this is given in table 10-2. So all the limit states covered by 10-1 are considered here, uh, but table 10-2 considers the weld shear and the shear rupture, this is due to weld. Those are added, okay? And th this is the weld capacity is based on what's used today, which is E70 electrodes, okay? That has 70 KSI strength. This is table 10-2 that, um, that gives the capacity. And again, it depends on the number of bolts. It depends on the length of the connection. Uh, those are of course together. The, so that, that will the, the, the number of bolts will dictate the length of the connection and also different weld sizes, okay? Different weld sizes. And whether the bolts are like this in the angles and then you have the weld in one side or the weld on the angles and the bolt in the other side. Okay, so that's that's why you say you have weld A and weld B. So there are two tables basically. This is if, if you have this case that's weld A. If you have this case that's weld B. Okay, all welded double angle connections. So this is all welded. So as you can see, much much less limit states: shear yielding, shear rupture, weld shear. Okay, so much, and this is again, these two are due to weld. So most of the limit states are gone because it's a welded, welded connection. So, so for this, uh, so the, the limit states covered by the table, weld shear and, and shear rupture. And this is table 10-3, so the same thing, same concept, weld A, weld B uh, are given. Uh, then we have single plate or shear tab connection. So um, for this, we have uh, uh, bolts. So we have many limit states uh, because of that. So we have bolt shear, and then we have on the beam, bolt bearing and shear yielding of the web. On the plate, we have all these limit states Okay, bolt bearing, shear yielding, shear rupture, block shear, buckling, frictional yielding, etc. And then since it's welded here, then we have the weld shear, okay? Uh, so what's covered by the tables is basically these limit states. So bo beam bolt bearing on the beam web and shear yielding should be checked independently. So those are not covered by the tables. And this is given in table 10-10. Okay, 10-10A, and there is, of course, B and C, depending on the bolt diameter. So there are different tables for different bolt diameters. So as you can see, it depends on the number of bolts, the bolt group, and whether it's N or X, uh, whether it's a standard hole or short slotted hole, and also in the plate, in the plate thickness. Um, welded bolted single angle. So instead of using double angle, okay, we use single angle. So we used welded bolted double angle, but this is single angle. So same limit states are checked like before, but here, since we have one angle from one side, so um, the capacity of course will be, uh, will be less. Uh, and it's recommended actually to use these if, if possible. Uh, but instead of using two, which is common, instead of using double angle connections, which has a lot of capacity that we may not need. So you can use a single angle connection or a single plate connection, shear tab connection. Uh, so for this, the limit states covered similar to before, since we have weld and we have bolt, so the same things are checked and that's what we have. So it's a single angle, so we have the weld, and we have the bolts are here, 
Okay. Um, so will the voltage T connection? So here, instead of uh, double angles, we use just a T section, basically. So th this, from here, this looks like a double angle, but it's actually a T section. It's a T section, okay? Uh, that is used to connect the beam to the girder, okay? So it's a T section for whatever length we need. Okay, so it's welded and bolted, welded from one side and bolted from the other side. So again, since this is uh, uh, welded and bolted, the same limit states that we checked or that we looked at before for all the welded bolted connections are, uh, are uh, 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 need to be checked. Okay, there are no tables for this. That's why uh, uh, this is not used much. Uh, but I mean, I know uh, one of the companies I worked for, we use this connection a lot actually, because it's, uh, it's uh, very convenient and it's just one element that, you know, connects that and capacity wise, of course, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, can be checked using the different limit states. Uh, so the tables in part seven, for the manual can be used to check, okay, what is the bolt shear, what's the bolt bearing, what is the block shear, etc. So the weld can be calculated manually, just like we talked about just a few minutes ago, okay? Now, bolted and stiffened seated connections. So we like for seated connections, as you can see here, so this is the seat here, so it's bolted. And then this is it's welded from here, okay? So this will take the load that's coming from, from the beam like that. So here, the limit states on the beam, web crippling, web local yielding, we talked about those. Uh, for the angle, we need to check flexural yielding because it's, it's an angle and has a load on it. So we need to check the yielding of that uh, element. So flexural yielding, shear yielding, flexural rupture, shear rupture. And for the, for the bolts, for the connectors, bolt bearing and bolt shear have to be checked here. So this is how this would look for the seat. And the top one actually does not contribute to the capacity. This is just to keep the beam in place. This is the one that takes all the load. Okay, the bottom one is the one that takes all the load. Now, um, uh, limit states covered by the table, we have shear yielding, flexural yielding of the outstanding leg, right? So this is the outstanding leg. Uh, and also bolt limit states, we have bolt shear, bolt bearing and block shear, okay? So these are the tables. So, th so it depends on the required bearing length. And we saw how we determined this just a few minutes ago. It depends also on the angle thickness, okay? Uh, and also like an angle length of six inches. Okay, so based on that, we can, um, uh, we can determine the capacity of these angles. Uh, uh, now, welded and stiffened seat connection. So we have uh, these limit states that need to be considered. So basically these two bolts here just to keep it in place. What's important here is the connection to the column, whether it's welded or bolted. So in this case, it's welded and the previous it was bolted. So we have to consider all these uh, limit states. So what's covered by the tables, shear yielding, shear rupture, weld strength and also flexural yielding of the outstanding leg, similar to the previous one. So that's, that's uh, again, this is the table, it's a similar structure, but this, this includes the weld strength uh, of, uh, you know, of, the, of the leg, of the weld on the leg. Okay, shear end plate connection. So this is basically just a plate at the end that's bolted to the girder. And then we will come with this girder, with this beam, 
will come with this beam and just weld it here on both sides. Okay, so that's uh, so that, that's what it is. Uh, so that's why it's shear end plate connection. So we have bolts and we have welds. So we check the common block, uh, common bolt and weld limit states like we discussed before. Um, so what's covered by the table is bolt shear, bolt bearing, shear yielding, shear rupture, block shear rupture, weld shear, and shear rupture of the base metal. Um, and this is the table that shows that, and it depends on the type of bolts, whether it's N or X, whether it's standard or oversized, um, also slip critical, and also in the end plate thickness. Um, so for the weld and beam web available strength, so because the plate is connected to the web of the beam, so we have um, uh, also given uh, the minimum web thickness required. And then uh, we have whatever um, capacity in, um, uh, in, in, in SD and LRFD and also the support, right? The support member capacity, which is this. So we have the beam of this beam here, okay? And also the support capacity is given as well in the table in kips per inch. Okay, moment connections. Uh, so moment connections are used when we need to transfer a moment. You know, so when we have rigid connections. So there are different types. Here, what we have is bolted moment connection. So you can see we have bolted shear, we have bolted moment. So we have many things to check if we have, if we are using this connection. So block shear of the plate and the beam flange, bolt bearing of the plate and the beam flange, bolt shear, plate buckling, and then tension rupture of the plate and the beam flange, and then tension yielding of the plate and the beam flange, and weld strength. So we have to check those. Now, there are no tables for moment connections. You have to check everything here, pair the equations that we discussed before, okay? Now, this is welded flange plates, okay? So here we have the weld, we have the weld, we have the weld, we have the weld, okay? So, um, of course, you know, also from the bottom here. So here you can see because it's welded connection, many things have been reduced. Okay, many things have been, uh, many limit states have been uh, reduced. Uh, and then we have directly welded flange. So the flange is directly welded to the column flange. So there are no plates. There are no plates. So here we have to check compression buckling of the column web. Okay, so here we have, as a result, we have uh, these forces from the moment, right? So this is the moment. We have these forces from the moment. So what happens here is that if we resolve this moment, we'll have a couple here. So we need, we need to make sure the web here does not buckle from this concentrated force, okay? And then also local flange yielding. So we don't want also the flange to yield from this concentrated force. And the local web yielding is the same thing. And also the weld strength is important here, okay? Because that's what transfers the loads from the beam to the column. Splices, moment splices. Uh, so if we have long beams, so they come to the side in pieces, okay? They come to the side in pieces, and then we connect them together by uh, uh, plates like this for moment at the top and bottom and for shear along the web. So as you can see, this is all bolted. So a lot of limit states need to be checked using the equations that we talked about uh, before. Um, uh, column splice, same thing. In going in a multi-story building, column over column, column over column, then we will have, um, we have to connect the columns to each other, 
sub to the one below. Uh, so uh, it could be they could be bolted connections and they could be welded connections. Okay, so limit states that need to be checked, bolt bearing, bolt shear, shear rupture, shear yielding, same that we discussed before. And we have the equations for all these, but that's what need to be checked. Column base plates. So the base plates are either connected to concrete or to another steel member, as you can see on the right, okay? So here we have a column sitting on a beam and here we are adding stiffener Y to take the axial load that's coming from the column. So we can have the stiffener take all that load. If not, then we have to check uh, beam uh, whip crippling, side sway buckling, etc. Okay, like we talked before. Okay. So if we are, uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, this case, then we can do all the checks. This is all steel. If it's concrete, then we have to consider concrete limit states as well. Concrete crushing, uh, concrete, uh, you know, play out, break out, et cetera. So for that, there's AISC design guide number one that, that deals also with the concrete limit states, but it's not in the scope of this uh, lecture. Uh, so we need to check bolt bearing, bolt shear, bolt tension, uh, because it's axial load on the column. So depending on the direction of the load, uh, flexural yielding, plate and connection elements, and the weld strength all has to be checked. Okay, now uh, talk, we'll talk about some practical considerations. So these are basically the limit states and connection design and what need to be checked in each type of connection. So we'll, let's take a look at some of the practical consideration. So here we have some tips and suggestions. These are not uh, code, uh, these are not requirement by codes, but these are suggestions that, you know, that are based on good practices in structural steel design. So first of all, in any connection we design, we have to think about constructability because constructability means economy. If we have a connection that is constructible, then that, you know, this will result that it's, it's, it's cheap, okay? Uh, uh, so we have to think about that. So, uh, simplicity, simplicity means economy, same thing tend to use a simple connection that can be built in the field, okay? Things on paper are different than, than things on the field. And also, you know, um, like labor, you know, workers who are putting all these things together. So the simpler the connection, the, the less the errors that might be in the, in the field, okay? So, um, uh, least weight does not always mean least cost. So if we are selecting like, for example, uh, beam size or column size to be like the least weight, but this may result in a, in a, in a, in a complex connection uh, or maybe a require, requiring adding stiffness as we will see. So choose something that will produce simpler connection. Keep that in mind. Simpler connections, that's a key. So fewer pieces, greater economy. Try to avoid stiffness. And efficient connection design, again, reduces cost. So that's what's important is the connection design. Um, show the reactions. Show the reactions. Instead of designing for the capacity or percentage of the capacity of the beam, show the reactions. Either you as a connection designer or the fabricator, if they are designing the connections, will design for the reactions that are shown, okay? Um, do not require connections to be designed for the full shear sink. We talked about that. Avoid notes such as this is uh, this in your drawings. Connection shall be designed to support full shear strength of the member. We, this is not recommended. Show the reactions and, and design for that. 
uh, do not require connection strength to be based on a table 3-6 of the manual, okay? Because this, is, this gives you the capacity of the member itself. And typically we don't, especially for shear, the shear, the shear capacity typically is high. So beams typically are controlled by bending and deflection. So we don't wanna design that for the maximum uniform load values that might be on that beam. So that will be an overkill, uh, you know, in the connection design. So avoid uh, like notes uh, on the drawings showing this connection shall be designed to support the actions occurring from uniform loads equals to 150% of the uniform load capacity according to table three dash six. And we're showing these notes because engineers used to use these notes on the drawings. So this is uh, this is uh, this is uh, excessive in, in in connection design. Uh, here you have an example. So we have uniformly distributed load on it, uh, and here we have the action fifty four. Here we have a concentrated load from a column above. So look at the difference in these reactions. So be careful. Okay, if you have a note like this without paying attention to something like that then we have a problem. Now, this will not be conservative. We may, have a, we may have a problem at the connection here, okay? So show the reactions. Now it's easy with computer modeling that we do for structures. You can get the reactions, show the reactions. And, and, and then if you are designing the connections, you, you have all the reactions. If you are sending this to a fabricator, then also they have all the reactions. Avoid notes such as uh, this is uh, this on your drawing. Uh, so we, uh, we talked about this. Um, so then if you have concentrated load, they will submit an RFI asking for reactions. So show that from the beginning. Uh, moment connections. Um, show the moment and the axial loads on the, on the drawings. So if you have a braced frame, show the axial load on those braces, okay? 10 kips, 20 kips, 50 kips, et cetera. Show that. If you have a moment connection, show the moment so they can design for that force. Uh, so also if you have hangers, if you have drag struts, if you have braced frames, trust members, show the reactions. Um, do not require connections to develop the full capacity of, of um, of the section unless required by the analysis of the building code. When will this be required? It only on in, uh, sorry, in seismic connections. And that's according to AISC 341, the seismic provisions. Okay, so if it's required by the code to do that, then we can do it. Otherwise we, can, we, we don't have to. Show also the reaction directions. Not only the reactions, but also the directions. You may not need to design for uh, for both directions. So here we have the shear force. We have the moment. So show the right direction. If they are in one direction, then, then just show it. For example, if it's a gravity load, then it's it's in one direction. Uh, if it's a seismic, it could be in, in two directions. So make sure you show that and make that it's clear for the designers because you may not have to design. So this will be in compression now. This will be intention. So here, you know, we need to design that accurately and, and properly. And here, this may not be an issue. Many limit states will be eliminated because this is compression, okay? So that's why it's important to indicate that. Require connections to be designed per the, per the, per the building code. So, if there are gravity connections typically, or even a seismic connections with R equals three, then that's what we use. But if it's typically if for seismic connections with typically with R, which is the response modification factor, R is the response modification factor, uh, then we have to consider the seismic provisions for the connection design, okay? So indicate that. So if, if the fabricator is designing this, so they need to know which code they need to use. Um, avoid uh, notes such as all bolted connections shall be 
it's hypocritical. We don't need that. So as I said before, bearing type are cheaper, are more economical. Okay, they require less work in preparing the surfaces and all that stuff. So we don't need slip critical everywhere. So don't use a note like this. You use slip critical where you need it. Permit the use of one side connection. So single angle or single plate. We talked about that, right? So you don't have to use double angle connection because I mean, it's common. Many people use that, but you don't have to. You are adding a lot of material by adding another angle. Imagine how many beams you have in a floor and then how many floors you have. So if the actions can be taken by a single plate or a single angle, do that, okay? And then don't have a note on the drawing saying, avoid using single and added connections, et cetera. So uh, uh, try to use those uh, for the loads that you have. Um, permit the use of any size of bolt and type. Okay, so give the fabricator the flexibility to use the size and the type uh, because this depends on the availability that they have. If they are designing the connections, let them do that. Okay, give them the freedom to do that. Okay, don't tell them that all bolts should be three quarters of an inch. Okay, maybe, you know, they want to do seven eighths of an inch for the bolts that they have in stock. Um, um also also permit the use of short slotted holes so the standard holes are circular typically and then the short slotted holes are like that so and then the bolt will come you know here so this will give them some flexibility with the tolerances okay so and this is okay for vertical loads that are coming like this this is okay from like statically uh, this is okay. So allow them to do that because this will 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 ease the fabrication and the erection. Um, delegate connection to design to the fabricator. So according to the AISC manual factors, um, the owner the owner's designated representative for the design shall indicate one of the following. So complete the connection design shall be shown on the structural drawings. So all the connections should be shown in the structural drawings, okay? So the fabricator in that case, they have just to fabricate. They don't need to design. Uh, two, in the structural design drawings or specification, the connection design shall be uh, uh, designated to be selected or completed by an experienced steel detailer. So steel detailer will, 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 uh, will, will do that. Um, and in the structural design drawings or specifications, the connection shall be designed, uh, sorry, designated to be designed by licensed professional engineer working for the fabricator. Okay, so that's the same thing. This is delegation of the connection. Uh, this is delegating the connection design, but it tells you what, like, you know, what should be done. Um, and that a design professional who actually typically would stamp, you know, the calculations of these connections that would be reviewed by the structural engineer. So um, delegate connection design to the fabricator, but do so properly. What does that mean? Give the fabricator all the information that they need. For example, give them all the forces, whether it's shear, axial moment, give them those whether it's a service load or factored load, whether it's LRD or ASD, okay? Um, um, so they, they would need all that information. So when they are designing, they are designing the correct capacities for the load that you have given. Um, um, Possible note for delegating connection design with R equal three. So this is like, this is a seismic system with R equal three response modification factor, but does not require seismic detailing. So for that, they can use only what we covered today, which is uh, C360 provisions without getting into the seismic manual uh, requirements. Um, Frame girders to columns, to column flanges and beams to whips. So the girders are typically bigger. 
So frame those to the column flanges. And the, the beams are typically smaller. Frame them to the web. Okay? Not the opposite. Size columns to eliminate need for stiffness. So choose a column size that will accommodate the connections that will not require stiffness or cutting of the beams or coping of the beams, etc. So columns typically are, are probably the least, uh, the least cost in all steel in a building is the columns, okay? Because how many columns you have in a floor? Okay, you may have, let's say 50 columns, but you may have 250 beams in that floor, right? So choose a size, a larger size that will accommodate these connections. Uh, where column stiffness can be avoided, make opposing beams as the same depth. So here to avoid uh, like a skewed or inclined stiffener like this, use the same depth. This is easier from a fabrication standpoint and also from a load transfer standpoint, okay? Uh, use, again here, uh, use the deepest practical column. Avoid using W8 columns. See, W8s, you barely can fit a connection there, okay? So you have six inch to play with, not much. So the larger the, the, the column size, you see, the better, or the, you have more freedom to, 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 to uh, 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 erect the, uh, you know, the connection and the member that's connected to it. Orient columns to minimize skewed connections. Okay, so um, this column, as you can see, will require one, two, three skewed connections. Okay, this is one right connection. Here, if we orient the column right, we'll have one skewed connection only, okay? Um, orient columns in braced frame square. So if you have, if this is a braced frame, do not use something like this, just make them square. So, because there will be a gusset plates, there will be a brace coming into it. There will be a column. There will be, this is the column, this is the beam. There's a gusset plate. There's a gusset plate and there's a member, okay? So it's not just a line. So basically we need to make sure that we, we do this correctly. So, um, so if it's skewed here, the connection will be a mess, okay? So here is an example of how this can be uh, done nicely if it's a square, not, uh, not skewed. So here you have examples. So this is nice and square. This is skewed, so you can see we had to cut this and uh, we have to use double rows because of the geometry. And look at this same thing. So we have long plate here which will have will require a really large moment on this. And you will end up with four columns of volts. So that's, um, that's an issue. So configure framing, so there no more than one beam framing into, this, into the same side of the column. So in the drawings, you know, this may look like that, which is easy, okay, and simple. Um, now, in reality, it's not a line. So if we look at this, so you have two beams coming like this. So you have all that hatched area is a conflict. So we need to cut that. We need to cut that steel to make it frame into it. If we do that, we may have to reinforce the beam with an angle like this. So that's, that's more money, that's more material, that's more weld maybe, that's more labor. So that's why you need to avoid this. And then avoid steep skewed connections like this. Okay, so instead of doing this, use something like that. So you can use another beam and then bring this a little bit further and let it frame nicely with a square uh, connection. Um, minimize the skewed connection same thing in framing. So here you have a skewed connection, here you have skewed connection, here you have skewed connection here. 
and there and there. So you have only, you have only, that's actually six and seven here. So you have only this one and that one, imagine. However, if we configure the framing right, so we will have this, we will have that, we will have um, this, we will have that, and this, okay? So we have less skewed connections in this. Okay? Typically they are problematic. And uh, you can use also round columns instead of a square columns to avoid uh, again, skewed connections like this, okay? So in round columns, all the connections will be square, as you can see. But if it's an HSS, then we have to, as you can see, we, we, we have to deal. Now this is okay, but this and this are skewed connections. Uh, again, configure the framing correctly. So here we have a, a beam that's coming into 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 like that into the the, the the joint. So you can see here, this is just a line. That's how we show it in the drawings. In reality, this is a beam with a width. Okay, so now this would require cutting here. Okay. Okay, now choose columns with 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 an appropriate flange width, so you can have enough spacing between the bolts. Typically, six inches or more. Okay, six inches or more. Uh, provide sufficient information on the drawings to minimize uncertainty among bidders. So, try to show as much information as possible. And this is again to the AISC manual of practice. Try to show uh, like loads, uh, design philosophy, whether it's LRFD, ASD, reactions, um, details, of course, like typically, like, you know, general details. Of course, they will do the shop drawings and the details, but try to show them as much information as possible to avoid um, like you know, confusion or underestimate or overestimate certain things in the in the bed. Uh, do not delegate design of plate girders. So plate girders uh, is is actually need is a plate girder is a design is a built up beam member that need to be designed by the engineer. So do not delegate that. That weld size here and length is a design parameter for that plate girder. So. If you are the structural engineer, you have to complete that design. Do not delegate that, okay? Because and also the limit states for this, you know, uh, you know, are are many you know, that need to be checked. So uh, it's part of the design. Uh, think about how connections would be detailed when you have, a, um, for example, a case like this, like two uh, plate girders, okay, that are supporting loads, okay, one next to each other. So what will, how we will deal with the connections here. So think about that. So we don't have an issue during, during construction. Configure HSS framing uh, to simplify the connection. So here we had to cut that. Uh, so to, oh, uh, for example, which is not preferred, uh, just use something like this if possible, okay? Use something like that. So use a plate, use a shim, bring the HSS like this. And here use also a plate welded to the wall of the HSS like that, not a through plate like this. This is a through plate is not wrong, by the way, but this will require cutting and inserting the plate and welding around it. It's a lot of work. This is much simpler. Okay. Um, for uh, some of the welding tips, try for downhand or vertical welds, okay? So try to do downhand, not overhead welds, that's the key. So do not use overhead welds. Avoid specifying all around weld. Okay, all around weld, avoid specifying that unless you need to. Avoid specif specifying complete joint penetration weld, moment connections. You can, um, you know, you can design the weld. 
if you need CHGP, CJP, that's fine, but you can design the weld, the fillet weld, even for that uh, moment connection. Fever fillet welds over groove welds. So for the same reason. So this is cheaper and easier to, to, to do. Uh, select efficient diagonal bracing, like single diagonals for small loads. Uh, double angle for um, uh, double angles, uh, efficient, typically these are efficient connections because you have double shear in it. Uh, HSS, these have the highest strength per pound of steel. So round or rectangular HSS uh, or square HSS. Uh, double shapes are good for high axial load, not like typical loads. So, um, and we rarely use those except for maybe high rise buildings and complex structures. Um, select efficient diagonal. So angle here with bolts, uh, an HSS with well, simple. Uh, here you have a white flange. So you can see how we are connecting that. Okay, so it requires two angles, bolts here, bolts there, it's complicated. Okay, versus this, and that. Uh, configure slope of the diagonal. So make sure that the, the angle is, is acceptable to make an efficient brace that will take tension of compression loads. Okay, and the connection can be done also properly. Okay, versus something like that. So this is more efficient than what's shown there. Uh, so you can see here, for a small angle, see what, what the gusset, what type of a gusset plate we would need versus something like that. Uh, orient columns and moment frames for strong axis bending. So if we have something like this, you can see each connection takes 20%. If this is in the weak axis, so they will take less and the strong axis ones will take more. In that case, you can eliminate the moment connections at the end and let these take the load, okay? Because in the weak axis, they, can, they do not contribute much. Uh, and also connect the moment connection to the flange if you can, not to the web. So if it's to the flange, you can see how nice this can be versus to the web where you need long plates. As you can see, you need to cut plate like that, and then bolt it to the web of the beam. So this is much more efficient than, than this one. Um, run heavy moment connections, girders through the columns to simplify the flow of moment through the column. So here, instead of using something like that, it's, I mean, again, it's not wrong, uh, but what you can do is basically, uh, let the column run over the column here the beam run over the column, okay? And so we have the column from below and then we have the column from, uh, from above. And here we have, you know, stiffness, okay? So he, this will end in much less bolts than what we have on the left-hand side. If you have a cantilever, uh, if you have a cantilever, then uh, let the cantilever beam run over the column. Okay, so this would be much simpler than using something like that. Okay, again, this is not wrong, but this is much better. Okay, um, minimize the little pieces of steel. Okay, gingerbread as known. Uh, so brace angles, relieving angles, bent angles, stiffness, web doubler plates, little beams, etc. So try to minimize those. Uh, avoid skewed connections in, in, in moment connections. This is very complicated. So having a connection that will transfer moment in these orientations is difficult to detail. Avoid full depth stiffness. So if we don't need full depth of stiffness for bearing, then we don't need that. Okay, we don't need that. So, so, uh, uh, so you don't have to extend them all the way. Okay, uh, you can stop them at a certain distance. This will avoid cutting 
uh, at the fillets and also will, will allow you minimize the weld, etc. Simplify base plates and anchor uh, uh, details. So try to use maybe if you use a if you can use a square base plate, that is ideal because the arrangement will be you know symmetrical and will be simple. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, if you if you cannot and you have to use a like a rectangular uh, a base plate, then the, arrange the arrangement of the anchors will not be symmetrical. So, um, uh, so in, in most of the cases we use square. Sometimes if we can't, for example, if a wall supporting a column or something like that, we are limited by the width of the wall, etc. So um, it depends on the condition that we have. Um, for hangers, so here we have like three cases for hangers. So we have a, a hanger that's connected here. Um, you know, uh, so we have a plate and bolts and this is welded to it. And then there's a beam here and a connection like that. Uh, but here we have to provide like stiffness above. Okay, here is the same thing. So we have that member Okay, with the axial load for whatever that is. Uh, then we have that plate, and then we have that those stiffness in the column. Uh, here we can just change the direction of that angle. Just make that, so this is the web, have a plate that's at, along the same line exactly, and then connect to it. Okay, so, so now the load is transferred through the web. So we'll not cause any flange bending here and there, okay? So this would be the ideal and the least expensive, okay? Um, understand the, the preferences of fabricator. So um, for the preferred connection details from the beginning, so shield connections, moment connections, brace frame connections, truss connections, try to understand what they prefer before they start and you get it in the review and you have something else in, in mind, okay? So with this, I conclude. If you have any questions, I would be glad to uh, take them. Any questions? Okay, I think if there are no questions, we can uh, conclude here. So here you have my emails. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions that, uh, that you may have, okay? Thank you.